Okay, welcome back, everyone. So let's get into chapter 19. Now, oh, what I've noticed is chapter 19, 20, and 21. Uh, a lot of it is repeated, uh, but I'm just going to go over some of the important points, uh, chapter 19, 20, and 21. So, But then in between, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to stop me. You can ask me at any time, OK? So let's get into chapter 19. Proclaiming the uncompromised gospel with power. Now, all of this is uh, not new to us. I think we've gone over this quite a few times, but let's just look at a few thoughts here. Jesus instructed for the gospel to be ex proclaimed with power. Acts 1.8, uh, we know that verse. Uh, let's just read that quickly. Acts 1.8. Acts 1 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnessed, witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Mm. What's the focus here? And you will receive power. The Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be a witness. So the Lord Jesus Himself is commissioning the, the disciples here. The 120 is saying, go and wait. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. When it comes upon you, you will receive power to be a witness. So when you and I are ministering the gospel, we minister in power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Right? Now, power does not mean scream and shout. That's not a... Just because we scream and shout and, you know... Uh, Teach and preach doesn't mean that's power. Power is to know what the gospel is and to walk in that walk in obedience of the gospel. Then you know, you and I know the authority. That is the power of the gospel. Peter, the apostle, he didn't know what the power of God was until you know he was afraid. But after the, the Pentecost. The fear was gone. He understood the power of the gospel. He understood the power of the cross. And he was able to stand. Same Peter, right? So when you and I are ministering to individuals, ask God for signs, wonders, and miracles, uh, and we proclaim the full gospel, salvation to the total person, signs, wonders, healings, miracles. Now. That is one way of ministering. Now, there's another way here. Paul reasoned and demonstrated. Peter writes and he says, be ready to give an apology, a defense for the gospel. So there is the aspect of signs, wonders, and miracles, which is the most common way to minister to people in a church. But there is also the aspect of reasoning, using of intellect and wisdom. Look at some examples here. Acts 13, in Acts 13 at Paphos, let's move, let's just open to that passage, Acts 13. Acts 13, 6 through 12, uh, they traveled through the whole island until they reached Paphos. And there they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar Jesus, who was attending, who was an attendant of the proconsul. The proconsul an intelligent man sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elemas the sorcerer opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elemas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now, the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind for a time and you will be unable to see the light. Right? Paul reasoned with him. Why are you trying to, when the proconsul was willing to listen to the gospel, this Elemist, the sorcerer, is saying, don't listen to them. Paul is reasoning with them and he demonstrated his power by saying, now, because you're trying to go against God, against what God wants to do in this person's life, 
So you'll be blind for a while. Thessalonica, the same thing. At Beria, that's beautiful. Acts 17, in Beria, they, uh, Paul went there. He, re he preached the gospel for some time. But the Berians were of noble heart. That's what the scripture says. Uh, Acts 17, 11. Now the Berians were more of noble character than the Thessalonians. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was the truth. So now... There's no account of the Berians seeing any uh, miracles they may have been. But the Holy Spirit in his wisdom thought that this would be right to put here. The Berians went back. They received the message. They didn't stop Paul from preaching. Okay, preach what you want to preach. They preached. They heard the message, received the message. They went back. They opened to the scriptures and said, what is this guy saying? He's talking about some Messiah and he'll come. Is it true what he's saying? And they began to you know, open the scriptures and try to see if what Paul was saying is truth. They reasoned the gospel. At Athens, we know this, Acts 17, Paul finishes from uh, Berea. They wanted to kill him. He goes into Athens. Athens, he leaves the two other uh, companions and he goes alone into um uh, Athens and he's he's looking about remember that Acts 7 17 right and there are two kinds of people we talked about all of this uh, and there he begins to reason again in this passage Acts 17 there's no sign of uh, any miracle done there so if you look at Acts 17 after he sp spoke and all of this happened he gave a defense for the gospel look at verse 33 at that Acts 17.33, at that, that means after preaching and, uh, and giving a defense for the gospel, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Look at that. No signs, no wonders, no healings, no blind seeing, no deaf hearing, no lame walking, nothing. Paul just reasoned. He spoke the gospel. He gave a defense. At the end, few people believed Paul and followed him. A church was planted. Right? Then in Corinth, the same thing happens. In Ephesus, again, the same thing happens. Where people begin to reason the gospel. So when you and I are presenting the gospel, yes, we want to see the miracles now. It's wonderful to see miracles. right? Healings, deliverance. But remember, the gospel as the power of God unto salvation is enough to touch a person's life and change them. So don't depend 100% on miracles. Now, in a time that we are living in, what I've noticed, very keenly noticed, a lot of ministries, not only in uh, outside of India, but even in India nowadays, people are so focused on the healings, the miracles, prophetic prof prophecies. And now they've come to a place where they name themselves prophet this, prophet that. You see where the emphasis is going? I'll come to church because he's a prophet. I'll come to church because he's a healing evangelist and he will bring healing for me. Now, that is one of the aspects of coming to church. But if God wants, you can be preaching about you know, something from the Old Testament and he can touch your life and change a person. Any, any person, he can take any simple 10-minute message, which is the word of God, and change a person's life. So remember this, you and I, we, we, we desire healings and miracles, but also the word. Scripture is the foundation of on what we stand on, right? So present the gospel in ways that are relevant, addressing to people while demonstrating the supernatural power of God. Jesus did it so beautifully. He taught. Remember when he took those five loaves of bread and two fish? What was he doing before that? Was he doing continuous miracles? Okay, tell me what you want to see. You want to see this tree going there? You want to see... The whole time he was teaching them, preaching to them. Then he realized, oh man, time up. 
I've been preaching, teaching for so long. These people are sitting in the sun. They haven't had anything to eat. We have to give them something to eat. Now he taught them what God can do, who God is, what God can do. Now came an opportunity for supernatural miracle. Five loaves and bread, two fish. That's all we have. Don't worry. Broke it, gave it thousands, eight, 12 baskets remaining. But where was the focus? Teaching and preaching. He followed that up with signs, wonders, and miracles. So be, be very, very you know, clear in your ministries. Right? When you're going for the supernatural, when you're desiring for the supernatural, don't miss the important also, the critical. Right? So you want to, you know, if you'd like to name yourself prophet, evangelist, all of that, that's okay. But the word, get into the word, preach the word, follow that up with signs, wonders, and miracles. Because it's very easy for people to receive the miracle and then say, okay, I've done. And they can go back. The word is what can sustain us. How do we know this? In the book of John, Jesus says, I know, I knew what was in their heart. Why did, why were there 3,000 people sitting and listening to him? More than half of them only wanted a miracle. Oh, this, this man is some prophet and um, he's doing all these miracles. So let's go listen to what he's saying. Where are they when Jesus died? After Jesus died? Thousands of people. 120 people are sitting and praying. All of them went back to their work. And Jesus himself knew they're there for the miracles. But look at the mercy of God. He knew what's in their heart. But still he did those miracles. Still he healed them. Still he you know, delivered them. And so when we are presenting the gospel, address through the word of God. Address people. Minister the word of God in power. Sometimes you don't even need to pray for people. They will receive the healing just by hearing the word. I'm telling you. I've, I've, I've been a recipient of it. And I've seen people being healed just by preaching and reading the word of God. And sometimes we put all our focus on God. Give me one prophetic word. Give me one prophetic word. I need prophecy. Only then people will get to know me. Only then people will recognize me. Or give me uh, you know, healing gift, Lord, so that people can recognize me. No. So we, we want, we desire it, but we don't want it so that people can recognize. We want it so that we can bless the body of Christ, so that we can be a blessing to people. Now your healing and miracles can happen even when you're doing, you know, when you're preparing and teaching the word of God. Right? So, how do we break controlling powers? There will be powers of darkness. There will be the enemy trying to control situations. Just because we are planting a church, planting a ministry, the enemy is not sitting back and saying, oh man, I'm not. Another church is being planted, what to do? No, no, no. The enemy is working and he's working over time, especially now. Right? If you look at what's happening, he is very easily infiltrated the church. When I say church, the entire church as a whole, globally. Very easily he can infiltrate. It's sad to see what's happening where leaders who are 20 years, 30 years in ministry, they're falling. Sexual immorality or money. See, these, these things are there, but we must learn how to fight against these things. The enemy can use these things against us as leaders. So how do we break these controlling powers? Again, we talked about this praise and worship, prayer, Righteousness, preaching, demonstration of the gospel. Uh, like Philip, Philip's preaching of the gospel set people in Samaria free from the influence of Simon the sorcerer. In Acts 8, Simon the sorcerer, people were going to him because they were, he was, you know, like in a way prophesying over people's lives. He would predict people's lives, tell them what to do, earning a good amount of money. And through evil spirits, he was doing that. But Philip, he went in there and through his preaching, uh, set free.
people who are under the control of this sorcerer. Just by preaching on God's word. Paul and Barnabas preached and demonstrated the gospel and set the ruler Sergius Paulus free from control of a man practicing sorcery. That's there in Acts 13. Acts 13, if you go there, we can see that, right? Uh, where Paul and Barnabas, again, by preaching and demonstrating of the gospel, they were able to bring people out of the enemy's grip. Three, Paul and his team ministered in Philippi, delivering the slave girl in ground level welfare. Again, Acts 16 in Philippi, there was a slave girl. Uh, maybe you can go back and read all of this. Uh, then, uh, you know, this, this is a region from the region free from the spirit. He, this region was controlled by the spirit of Python. Uh, remember this? Paul and Barnabas, their first missionary journey. Uh, they've finished, they've come back. Uh, they've done a great work. But now in their second missionary journey, there is, they're going to some of the most hostile places. And here in Acts 16, in Philippi, that slave girl comes with a snake around her. It's a python and says, uh, and she begins to say, you know, oh, these two who have come, they are from the living God. They know, you know, they know what they're talking about. Listen to them. And Paul looks back and says, silence, right? So he, through, through their ministry, he was able to get people to come out of the, the control of the spirit of Python. Paul and team ministered in Ephesus and dethroned the goddess of Diana over the people, the goddess that was the goddess of lust, goddess of uh, sexual immorality. Uh, again, even in Corinth, goddess Aphrodite. Uh, so wherever they went, they were able to preach, teach, proclaim, demonstrate the gospel, and break people from, you know, break the dominion of uh, controlled spirits over people's lives. Now, they did it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You and I can do it under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Right? Same Holy Spirit, same anointing. Only thing we need is the determination, the courage to do it. Right? But you hear, listen, we can start small. Right? We can always start small. We can start from where we are in Bible college, our supernatural hour every day, or your personal time in prayer. If God is putting a burden in your heart, Hold on to that burden and pray with all your strength and fervor. Right? Nehemiah had a burden for the walls of Jerusalem. Many Jews were there in, uh, in that place. But he had a burden. He held on to it and he prayed. Now, for example, I may not have a burden for the poor people on the streets, you know, begging and crying and or the homeless. I, uh, I may look at them, I feel sad, Lord, you know, just provide for them, be there for them. That may be just what my heart is. But the moment I see people who are maybe young people who are wasting their life, drug addiction, alcohol, I may have a burden for them. I say, God, they're so young. They have all their life ahead of them. They're wasting their life. They're only in their 20s. They have their whole life ahead. How can they do this? Now, that may be a burden for me. So I can probably spend more time praying for them than for the homeless people. You get what I'm saying, right? So the same way God will put a burden in each of our hearts. For some of them, it could be, you know, orphan children. Some of them, it could be, uh, you know, uh, couples without children. Whatever burden God puts in your heart. For some of them, it may be people uh, in, you know, I was just speaking to some of the students yesterday, second years, and they were saying in some of their places where they stay, there are no jobs only. So that's where people leave the villages, come to cities or towns. There's no jobs, in villages. How do people survive? And then God may put a burden for you to, you know, pray for that. Lord, let there be more jobs, more opportunities, right? People need to work. People need to provide for the family. Imagine there's no jobs. You have no other option but to leave the village, go to a town or city and work. Right? And it's hard. So whatever burden God puts in your heart, hold on to that burden and steadfastly pray until you see the Lord working in your heart. Right? Okay. Any questions? Any thoughts? Should we go ahead?
Then we go to chapter 20. Okay. Now, how can we equip people to, you know, especially as leaders, we are called to equip them. This Bible college, we are here because we want to equip people. That's the main intention, nothing else. Right? We want to equip people to grow in the Lord, become strong, and go up, go back, minister, build God's kingdom. That's the whole point of this Bible college. It's not for recognition. It's not so that people, oh, because we have a church, we should have a Bible college. It's not for that. It's not because we don't know what to do during the week, so we have Bible college. No. The reason we have Bible college is because we want to train young women, men and women of God, raise them up as leaders, release them, that they will go about to places where we may not be able to go, plant churches, plant ministries, and do great things for God's kingdom. That's what we want to do. I, you know, I, there are many of our alumni that I meet, and uh, sometimes they send me photos and pictures of their ministries, and it's so wonderful to see it, right? They were all sitting, they're all pastors, doing wonderful ministry, right? South India, North India, these are places that we may never go, right? Uh, villages and towns. Recently, one of our alumni, I think 2015 batch, he sent me a uh, Few pictures of a conference and there were at least 300 to 400 people uh, and his church has grown he started ground up from zero in his house he started immediately after he left from bible college he went he started in the house uh, the church began to grow he did everything you know that he has to do and now there are about 300 to 400 people in the church doing conferences and he also said you know people are inviting me for translation Right, from one language to English or from English to another language. And he said, thank you for Bible college because, because in Bible college, I learned English and developed my the ability to speak English. You see, that's what we want to see. And there is no other greater joy than to see this in people's lives. Right. So how do we want to equip, whether it's an urban setting, whether it is a... Uh, you know, a rural setting. We want to equip people for ministry. Firstly, teach God's word, right? The local church must feed God's people with the truth, wisdom, and understanding. The moment we teach God's word, we focused on that today. When we teach, the truth of God's word will go into people's hearts. And you, as leaders, will recognize the importance of God's word. And you'll be able to begin to share it with people. Here's the thing. One of the greatest signs of a leader, one of the signs of a leader, a good leader, is, is, a, is a good reader. A good leader must be a good reader. You have to read. How many of us like to read? Yeah. Now, those who don't like to read, it's okay. I was there. Right? I was in a place where I cannot read. But I want to encourage you, right, to ask God to give you that ability. It's just that initial phase, you know, what do you call that phase, no? Uh, that just that he just needs a little push. And once you get into it, you'll really enjoy it. See, for me, no? this laptop, all of it, even though I was a reader, I needed physical book, right? So there was a time, you know, 20, why do you think I'm still using notes? I have it here, no people, the thing, but I'm a person like this because I write, I write all my things on the side. I'm not much of a, you know, digital guy, but I realized that, Hey, it's 2024. I have to move on. I can't say, no, I need only physical. Now, I'm, for example, I'm preparing content for uh, Living Supernatural recordings tomorrow. So this is seven days in a week. So there are four weeks. So that's for 28 days recording I have to do. Each week, one topic. At, within two hours, I have to finish the recording. Two to three hours. So I have to go there, I have to deliver. 
Now I can't go there with one paper like this and start moving the paper there. Can I do that? I can't do that. I know I need to have something. I can't go with one laptop and sit there and start. So the, initially I used my phone. If you see the earlier uh, daily devotion, and I realized, see, the audience that I'm that we are catering to is an international audience. So firstly, I must know how to, okay. All I need is one nice, like maybe a tab so that I can just scroll it. Now, was it easy? Very difficult. Very difficult. Now, for me, I want books. I want books. If you see my, see my table, there are books everywhere. At home, there are books everywhere. Now, I go here and I want a book and I'm like, okay, where? I know what to preach, but the book is not available here online. What to do? Type. Now, it calls for a little bit of an effort, right? But even now, I like books. I like to hold a book. I like to write my notes. I don't touch a digital Bible at all. Only while preparing sermons, I do it. I go to Google, OK, or use one of the apps, use the NKJV version, and this. Otherwise, this is my go-to. This is what I use. I only read, read, read from here. Only then I'm satisfied. If I read four chapters from the laptop or from the phone, I'm not satisfied. Even now. But I know that I'll have to change. So the thing, what I'm trying to say is, we may not like to do something, but we may have to push ourselves to do it. Right? So for example, you know, when I started off, I didn't like to read. No, no, no. So I thought to myself, if I don't read, what kind of a leader I will become? What will I preach? I'll hear other sermons and preach that. There's no, I don't have anything then. So I said, OK, how do I start off? Definitely not the Old Testament. I'll close it in two, three minutes. So let me choose something that is interesting. So what I did was I went to the book of John. I started reading. Nothing I understood. But I just read. I forced myself to read. Okay, read. Then over, I think it was probably a month, I started liking it. Now, who puts that? It's the Holy Spirit. Am I a reader? No. Do I like reading? No. But I read a little. Then after that, slowly, I said, okay, let's look at Jesus. So I opened the book of Matthew. I started reading only the miracles. Then I started enjoying it. Oh, there's a person named Apostle Paul. Now, I've listened to sermons also. They're preaching about Apostle Paul. Oh, man, I want to know about this Apostle Paul. Then go to the book of Acts. Start reading. Right. Now, all of a sudden, you're getting interested in reading. My parents thought there was something wrong with me. Because one thing they know is I don't read. My, you know, my aunt gave me a book. The name of the book is The Cross on the Switchblade. By David Wilkerson, a very powerful book. That one book, I read it in one day. My parents came and they said, Are you reading a book? They thought, okay, it's some phase that will, you know, just something's happened to him. He's become a believer. Let him do something good he's doing. Let him read. Then they realized, because imagine my parents thought, well, What is he sitting with a book? One thing I know about Paul is he'll go out, play cycle, do something other than a book. But there came a time when I needed books. If I don't read, something is wrong. Even now, I read at least two books in a week. Whether it's a repeat or whether it's not a repeat, I read at least two books, apart from the Bible. Every morning, I read a couple of chapters, meditate on God's word. So if you're not a reader, read. Start small. Now you can start. Now you have the tabs and all of it. You can start that way. I just gave, told you that what I do. Now eventually I'll want to go to you know using the uh, digital content and uh, you know somebody was telling me you know nowadays you can make notes even on the yeah iPad or whatever. I said okay whatever that a time will come for that. I'm happy here, <laughs> but maybe I'll have to move to that. So what I do, you know, for a sermon, for example, for uh, Sunday sermons, I download the sermon on my tab. I go take a printout. 
I go through it the whole like three, four times. I make the write those examples. Then those examples, what I've written in the notes, I can go back to the tab and make those, you know, edit, add the examples in the right place, then go and preach the sermon. And eventually I stopped taking the printout. I said, okay, let me put the examples here itself directly. So at least one progress. So eventually you start begin. So the point I'm trying to make is, see, there are many things we may not like, but as a leader, we'll have to step into. Very simple. We have to step into it, right? So teaching of God's word. Two, place emphasis on the supernatural. <clears throat> Emphasize. Don't be afraid of the supernatural or don't shy away from the supernatural. Hey, who am I to pray for healing? Who am I to pray for a prophetic word, a word, word of knowledge? No, no. Maybe that other pastor is better than me. So let them do supernatural. I'll focus on just preaching the God's word. No. Place an emphasis on the spiritual supernatural. Say, you know, uh, as God's people, we must manifest his glory and we encourage people to pursue manifesting God's presence, power, and glory for their lives. We manifest it. We encourage people to manifest. Now, if I'm a leader of a church, when I don't manifest a supernatural, but I'm doing everything right in terms of preaching and teaching, the congregation will also feel like, okay, only preaching and teaching. So they wouldn't want to step out into the supernatural. Why? Because the pastor is not doing it. So it's very important that we emphasize and we have a balanced emphasis on the word and the supernatural. Three, equip God's people to be salt and light wherever they go. Show them the biblical truth to live out every day, whether in their home, whether in the workplace, whether in their families. See, it's very easy to say praise the Lord in the church setting. But what about in the family? What about at home? What about... Uh, you know, in the workplace, and my little son asked me, uh, my elder one, he asked me, Dada, you're a pastor, is it? Randomly. Randomly, right? He knows it. And he asked me last week, you're a pastor? I said, yeah, that's one of the things I do. More than that, I'm your father. I said, I'm your dad. Uh, no, but you're a pastor also. I said, yeah. So the Bible verse says, ask and it shall be given to you. I said, yes. Now I am asking you, Christmas, this is what I want. Will you give it to me? I said, no, <laughs> because this is not your age. Right? He wanted some, some like a video game thing. I said, no. I said, get something which you can do, which you, you know, I said, I have a surprise for you. I'll get you something nice for Christmas. And then now he's you know thinking about it. But the point is, he was telling me about all of this, and he was saying, uh, when I go to my school, many of them have asked me, they've they call me pastor's son. I said, How do they know? He has gone and told people, my father's a pastor. Now they're all making <laughs> they're all making fun of him. I'm a pastor's son. I said, So you told them. I said, No, just tell them. See. My father's a pastor, but he's a normal person. Right? And you don't have to be ashamed of it. Just be yourself. Right? Just be who you are. Don't have to try to, you know, because they asked him who taught you drums, where you play drums. Um, you know, the 10 standard children have asked him to play drums for some concert. And so I asked him which songs and all of it. So there was all these seculars. I said, no, avoid it. You don't need to play for all. You have to listen to the song, play the drums. <clears throat> and so they were asking him, how do you know how to play the drums like this? Such a small age. Are you going for drums classes? No drums classes. Are you, are you practicing at home? Who's teaching you drums? I just practice at home. Then it gave him an opportunity to you know, tell them, you know, I play in church. I play this. This is where I listen to the songs. I learn the songs. And the point is, he was telling me that uh, I want to be an example. I'm not ashamed that you are a pastor, but I want to be an example by telling my friends that, that you, as a, as a father, you're, my pastor, you're a pastor, but more than that, you're my father. 
and then you know there was this whole thing where he was saying you know, he, he was telling his friends that the reason i don't use bad words is not because of my father it's because of what we learn at home he was telling his friends but he says dad are they using bad words I said it's up to you that's all i say it's up to you you want to use it is it good for you you use it if you feel it's good for you i can't control you if you feel you want to use bad words there's nothing i can do i can just tell you i can just correct you he said no i don't like it i i feel somewhat when i hear that words so that's the holy spirit inside you speaking to you see the thing is we start them off small now as they grow up we don't know all we can do is pray for them right but we we are being the salt and light wherever we are there's a story let me share the story a beautiful story that i read we are like it's an analogy analogy right uh, so it's as if we are all salt have you seen a salt shaker we're all like salt sitting together in that salt shaker enjoying ourselves right all of us together in that salt shaker and then suddenly one of the salt says hey it's so nice to be here we are all together having fellowship together in the salt as salt then another salt another person says hey hold on you see that there's a soup bowl of soup that is boiling on the stove there yes any time the person can come take us and put us in the soup and gone we are all gone so i don't want this fellowship i don't like this and so there was a disagreement between these two but then one of the elder salts said see let me solve this problem for you it's true when we are poured into that soup we get dissolved in that soup and we will never see each other again but what is also true is that once we go into that soup that soup will never taste the same again we add flavor to that soup god has called us to be salt and light wherever we are wherever we are so we teach our people we teach our congregation to do that <laughs> equip god's people for a lifestyle of evangelism where they get ready to share the gospel at any time and anywhere especially you know we may have people coming from different spheres of influence now even as we equip them we give them guidelines on how to do it right and if you look at our nation of india there are there are limitations right so we don't go against government rules right uh we we try to do things in an orderly manner right uh but we equip them if you get an opportunity do it right nothing wrong then we equip empower and send same thing what jesus did create an environment where people can experiment discover their gifts and calling and function in the body so for example we have supernatural hour here for students for the church we have uh weekend school we have life groups we have you know uh, small events and conferences that are happening there these are places where people can exercise their gifts and try to flow in those gifts and right? worship uh worship nights right five days of prayer 30 days of fasting and prayer where we begin to exercise right now especially during those prayer times we may not be people who can sit and pray but then we exercise that gift hey god enable me to sit and pray for the next one hour that i don't get disturbed like what we do for our five days of prayer one hour of reading right god enable me this one hour help me to read you tell me what i should read speak to me give me maybe a 20 minute sermon out of this out of this chapter or out of this passage of scripture right so we create an environment where god can learn and so, sorry people can learn and experiment to empower people to step out and do what god puts in their heart now that you have used the gifts now you know some of you here you've been using the gifts that god has given you right worship and whatever gift god has given you now we want to empower you to go back and do it at your places right and thirdly send people out with a mission to impact the world it's so beautiful you learn experiment you learn step out 
you you exercise the gifts that God has given you, the talents and the gifts, and then you teach people, and it becomes an ongoing chain reaction. So they go out, they go on missions, they are able to do it. Right? But the point, the initial starts off by giving people an, ex an opportunity to experiment. If I, as a leader, don't give people an opportunity uh, to experiment, they may not even know it. Eventually, they may not even fulfill what God has for them. And then, you know, they just go by life how it is, happy attending church and going back. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But when God is saying, I have so much more for you, why should we limit them? Or why should I limit myself? If God is telling me, Paul, I have so much more for you, I would obviously want it. I say, yes, Lord, I'm ready. But God says, this is the things that you must do. It calls for a sacrifice. Okay, Lord, I'm willing to. Right? So these are a few points. Teach God's word. Place an emphasis on the supernatural. Equip God's people to be salt and light. Equip God's people for a lifestyle of evangelism. Equip, empower, and send. Right? Any thoughts? Any questions? Let me just quickly look at uh, chapter 21. OK. Francis Fangim Payne. I've never heard of him. Only heard of Francis who's here. Uh, but it takes a citywide church to win a citywide war. Very powerful. It takes a citywide church to win a citywide war. Now, when you talk about citywide, so let's look at the city of Bangalore. We have churches all across Bangalore, north, south, east, west. And nowadays, churches are just growing and growing and growing. Every nook and corner, we have a church. That's wonderful. Nothing wrong. We should not be comparing, hey, we are better than them. No. Whatever church, Hindi, Kannada, whatever language, it doesn't matter. It can be a church with five people. If it's a church, it's part of the citywide church. So look for ways to build trust and strengthen relationships with other churches and other ministries. That's something that we always like to do. One way is, uh, you know, back in 2012, uh, we had started this Bangalore Pastors Fellowship. And I remember we used to go there. Uh, so all the Bangalore pastors would meet early morning for breakfast. So we made an invitation. The right? so pastor would invite everyone. We would meet. We'd have worship. We'd take up one point. We would spend a few moments in prayer. Then we'd have breakfast. We'll come back. We'll probably take one, just one um, small lesson from the scriptures. We'll just Somebody will just share for maybe 15, 20 minutes. Uh, then we'll have group discussions, uh, pray for each other, pray for each other's ministry. And then they, we would leave. Now, this went on for many years, and it's wonderful. Because this way, we were able to build relationships. And many conferences that we did, you know, there were times we got opportunities to do conferences. And then we said, no, you know what? As of now, we are not able to. But we know a church who can help you with this conference. And we connected them. So what happened was this church was able to go and do a fruitful conference. It was not like only, OK, APC was not there. So then the conference only doesn't happen. No. So we were able to build a network of people. So over time, in our ministries, learn to build a network of people. Don't be focused on my ministry, my what I'm doing. God can use you to help other ministries. Right? Two, find ways to strengthen and serve churches and ministries in the city. Now, especially you know, when, when you are small, when the church is small, you may not be able to serve other churches. But there will come a time. Maybe 10 years down the line, you have established yourself in ministry. You may be able to serve others. So for example, I remember this happened quite some time back. One of our one of these pastors who used to come for our Bangalore pastors meet, uh, he requested, he was going through some illness. And he requested, see, we have the church, but we don't have worship leaders. We don't have a good worship team. We have all the equipment and all of it. And they asked us, can you send uh, you know, a team for maybe for five months until we are able to raise our people. So we had rostered teams every Sunday for this church. And I went there for a couple of Sundays to lead the worship there. Right? So we would go there far away. Maybe I don't remember uh, which part of Bangalore. 
I think it was Electronic City side. So we would go there, lead the worship, attend the service, and come back. But we were part of APC. You get what's happening here? Because the pastors had built a good relationship, a good rapport. They needed help with worship. They had the instruments, but no people to play. We sent our people to go. They went, led the worship. People were blessed, right? Because we had a good, we had good teams. And then eventually, we also had worship workshops there. We helped them to, you know, understand how to audition people and all of it. And eventually, they started had their own worship team, and we just stepped up. Said, okay, now that you all are ready, so you just build on what. But we helped them to, you know, in worship, help them with worship workshops, uh, taught them on worship, simple things. But we were able to strengthen and serve each other, right? Then three, look for ways to work with other churches and ministries towards reaching the city. Uh, that's something that we can do. One of the campaigns that happened in 2014 was called the Power to Change campaign. And in this campaign, uh, it was a worldwide campaign, global campaign. Uh, and so in Bangalore, we were able to work with many churches, uh, hundreds of churches. We all worked together. There was no personal agenda. We all worked together as a camp to you know campaign the ministry all across the city and our nation. We were also able to work with our missions uh, churches, missions pastors, say, hey, what we have, we'll help you. We'll send it to you. Just go out. Uh, let's build this campaign. So we were able to work together as a church. And when we do this, we maintain a kingdom mindset and encourage others in ministry. Very important. When we work together in ministries, we develop a kingdom mindset. And a good read would be Kingdom Builders and Divine Order in the Citywide Church. And so one of the conferences that we normally go out, especially pastors' conferences all across our nation is the Kingdom Builders Conference, where we teach people, teach ministries, pastors, local churches, that we are not building our own kingdom. We are building God's kingdom. And when we work together, we're able to be stronger. We're able to do more for God's kingdom. Right. So again, here's what I want to say. When you start off, you know, you may have to be very slow and it, it may take time but there'll come a time when you reach a certain level where you will be able to impact churches citywide churches so develop this ability of combining working together with different ministries right now even as you do that of course there are a lot of protocols a lot of things that you must be uh, uh, you know be wise in the decisions and all that that you do but as you do it you will learn right uh, you will learn on how to deal with these ministries, how to deal with people. But the end focus is, I want to build God's kingdom. Right? So we only need maybe one more Tuesday, and I will be able to complete the portions. Uh, just to keep you updated, next Tuesday, we won't have class because I will be traveling uh, since we have the youth missions. Right? You all... I know the students are leaving on Tuesday night, right? But I'll be leaving in the morning. Um, so, so then I want there won't be class. Uh, and we'll come back from our youth missions. And then the following Tuesday, uh, let me just get the date right. The following Tuesday, which would be uh, November 5th, yes. November 5th, we'll just uh, go over those. Uh, we have a little more. So we'll be able to complete our session on November the fifth right all right then thank you so much have a great week ahead and i'll see you soon god bless